What's up, YouTube? This is the 82 and 0 podcast. So, I've been gone for a while. I apologize to any of my fans. Now that I'm starting to get fans as this channel is growing. Okay. I made a video on Bill Russell, the defense of Bill Russell. And I kind of wanted to reiterate and make one about Will Chamberlain. And I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions, especially since Wilt is gone now and he's been gone for so long. There's a lot of misconceptions growing now about Wilt. And I just kind of wanted to break down some of the myths, you know. So one myth I hear a lot is, oh, he just dominated five foot six white guys or whatever. Now, there's so many reasons why this isn't true. Because if you look at the 1962 season, for example, at Will at his peak, right? The league average height was six foot ten, or sorry, the center height. I mean, was six foot ten. The league average height was six foot six. That's the same as it is today. And you know, the league was already starting to change by the late 50s. And become more predominantly African American. Because teams were starting to find out that. If we only have white players. We're not going to win. And the last team to have an all white team. Win a championship was the 1958 Hawks. So. Stuff was changing quick. You know it was becoming much more diverse. Becoming much bigger. Much more recognizable to today's game. And a lot of times people, myth number two I want to get into, a lot of times people will say, Wilt didn't have any competition. This couldn't be further from the truth. Now, the league had less teams back then, right? As I did a video on this before. So, you know, the concentration of talent was much deeper. So, Wilt every night would have to play a Hall of Fame center, you know? He might be one night playing Walt Bellamy. He might one night be playing Bill Russell. He want, he might one night be playing Wasson's old or <laughs> Elvin Hayes or later on maybe like a, a Dave Cowens, you know, or a day or someone like a I forget the center's name. <laughs> Artis Gilmore. I know they didn't play each other in the NBA, but, you know, they had NBA, ABA matchups. Uh, but one thing I think that gets lost with time, too, is, you know, a lot of times you hear people today say, well, if you take Kenneth Fareed and put him in the 1960s, you know, he'd be a Wilt Chamberlain. How stupid is this argument? Just because you're a seven-footer, right, doesn't make you dominate. If that's the case, right, if that's so if that's so true that these seven-footers are dominating just because they're seven-footers, why are there so many seven-footers that are bus? You know, someone like a Hashim Thabit, you know? It's, it takes a lot of skill, too. You can't just be tall and play. Sean Bradley didn't have all that skill. Or another thing to look at, too, is people will say he was taller than everybody. That's why he dominated. That's not necessarily true. There were times where he wasn't even the tallest player in the league, first of all. But I want to mention, too, if that's the case, how come Yao Ming didn't dominate so much over the league? I mean, he was... So much taller than everybody else. Why wasn't he dropping so many points? It's it's a ridiculous argument. And I think a lot of times people don't understand how the era was played. Um, they see these ridiculous numbers, right? Like his 50 points per game. They don't understand, I think, the pace of the era back then. Because... What you got to understand, they played at a much faster pace back then and even to than even to today. And so, you know, more shots equals more missed shots. So hence why he had such big rebounding numbers. 
and higher higher pace means more shots. And one thing you got to look at too is for the 61-62 season, for example, where he averaged 50 points per game, he played every minute of every game that season. So if you're playing every minute, you have more more time to take more shots. So another thing is the, the coach wasn't very good. Uh, his strategy was just give Wilt the ball, let him dominate, right? As, you know, Wilt figured out later in his career, get your teammates involved. You know, I think everybody knows that by now. But the point I'm trying to make is sometimes people see Wilt's stats and they just write it off as, wow, he just dominated everyone. They didn't stand a chance against him. It's, you know, look at how good other players' stats were in that era. Um, You know, that same season in 62, Elgin Baylor had ridiculous numbers. Bob Pettit had ridiculous numbers. Bill Russell had good numbers. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt how inflated the numbers are. I'm not taking anything away from him, but, you know, put him in a modern era, you know, with his athleticism, with his competitive nature. And that's another thing. A lot of people say he wasn't competitive. That's not true at all. He was very competitive. But put him in the modern era, right? You know, he's seven foot two in modern shoes. He's got all the athleticism in the world, all the strength in the world. He would probably put up like 33, 34 points per game. Uh, you know, maybe 13, 14 rebounds per game. So don't look at these old stat lines and, and think that these are like video game numbers. That was the style of play back then. It was so much quicker. Um, but if you adjust it, you know, there's still good numbers. I'm not taking anything away from him. But a lot of times people just try to write him off because of that era. And there was a lot of competition in that era. This is an, one thing I want to address. People sometimes tend to forget how competitive it is. They just think because, you know, the Celtics were winning so many championships that there was no parity, that there wasn't competition. There was a lot of great competition in this era. You know, I was mentioning great centers that he played against. Uh, Will, I want to say, played against probably, other than Kareem, played against the greatest collection of centers that's just my opinion because especially later on in his career in the early 70s the center competition started really getting a lot tougher and you know I've heard someone say well (laughs) Wilt was trash because when all these hall of fame centers started coming in the league he quit scoring he was he was trash but have you looked at his field goal percentage? It went up every single year. If they were locking him down, like they're implying, why wouldn't his field goal percentage? Why wouldn't why would his field goal percentage go up? Is what I'm trying to say. You know, there's never been an athlete, and there probably never will be again. Not for a while, maybe, to his level. You know, he took on guys every night like Bob Lanier. Willis Reed, Bob McAdoo. So it's just, it's ludicrous the argument that he didn't have good competition. You know, you just got to look into the kind of centers and power forwards that he played back in his day. And another myth I want to break down about Will is that he was a choker. I don't think this is all the way true about him because. He, I would say it's more his teams that choked than Wilt himself. Because if you look at like some of his playoff series early on, right, against Boston, they were all very close, very close series, you know. And his scoring numbers, right, started to go down once he started taking on like a lesser role with the Lakers, being more the defensive anchor. But 
did he really choke in these series? I mean, let's look at some of these series that he played in. I mean, let me pull up, for example, 1965, right? The Eastern Division Finals, seven-game series against Boston. He averaged 30 points and 31 rebounds. You know? You know, want me to pull up another one with Boston? Let's go with 1962 Eastern Division Finals. Game seven, right? Seven games, I should say. 33 points, 26 rebounds. I don't think this, you know, and he dealt with this in college too, where he would lose at the big stage, you know, some of his teammates would choke. And he would he would get the blame because he's the superstar. And I don't think that's all the way fair. And that's also a testament to the era because look at how close these Game 7s were back then, you know. People just think the Celtics steamrolled over everyone, you know. They won by the skin of their teeth a lot. Uh, like that Game 7 I was just talking about in 1962. The Celtics only won by two points, 109 to 107. And, you know, this brings me to my final myth I'm going to talk about in this video. I mentioned that his teammates choked. Yes, a lot of times they did. Not always the case. I mean, Jerry West stepped up. But one myth that I think some people perpetuate is where they say, Wilt Chamberlain didn't have any good all-stars around him or get any help. This couldn't be farther from the truth either. I mean, Wilt had a lot of help in his career too. And I know this might sound contradictory to my last point where I said they they choked, but the, he still played with a lot of great players. And especially when he got to the Sixers, once he had a good coach around him and a good team, they beat Bill Russell. They finally defeated him. In 1967. So, my opinion, it's sad to see Will openly being disrespected the way he is. You know, people just perpetuate these myths, and with times when it's in time when it's repeated enough, people believe it. So, I'm going to defend his legacy, and that's my video on Will. Let me know what you guys think down below. Thanks for watching.